Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me for this, uh, to this very interesting conference. Um, and I actually changed my title, if you, if you noticed. So yeah. the reason I changed my title is I was going back and forth between talking about what was the original title, which is about reverse hyperconductivity, and talking about the second topic. The second topic is, is a bunch of observations which are nice, and I wish that somebody had told me these observations five or six years ago, so I'm going to share these observations with you. And what's nice about these observations is that they were actually observed here at the Institute like uh, in the last couple of weeks. So there are going to be two parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, reverse hyperconductivity. I apologize to those of you who've seen a version of this at Cambridge uh, maybe a, couple, a year or two ago. And then in the second part, I'm going to talk about something that's really new that's from the last uh, week or two. And uh, one of the reasons I changed the title is that with the, in, at, in the age of the internet, there is a rumor that actually Christer Borel may be watching this talk as we're speaking, and he will send emails to Jeff if you have any questions or comments. Okay. Right, so that's what okay. So the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about the joint work with, with both Arnab and, and Krzysztof, who are both sitting here, and it's going to be about reverse hyperconductivity. And again, I'm going to go, to go even maybe a little faster than I'm usually going, because uh, we've seen this, 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 uh, this kind of stuff in, uh, quite a bit during the workshop. So I'm going to talk about uh, noise, noise stability or noise sensitivity in the discrete hypercube. The fact that there's a half here means that I'm looking at the uniform measure on the hypercube. And TT is the noise Markov operator, where the noise, what in the previous uh, talk uh, uh, Ronan called rho or rho square, now is going to be e to the minus t. So given x, I'm going to pick a y. How am I going to pick a y? For each coordinate independently, with probability <coughs> e to the minus t is going to stay the same. And with the, other probi with the remaining probability, I'm going to de-randomize it. So that's the noise that we're going to look at. So that's one definition and equivalent. Second definition is the functional definition. We act, from, we act on functions. What do we do to a function? Well, with probability e to the minus t, <laughs> if we look at a function on the two-point space, this probability e to the minus t, we stay at the function, and otherwise we other, average the function. So this is the operator on the two-point space. And then we look at uh, minus 1, 1 to the n. We are looking at the n's, n wise tensor of this operator. And I'm going to do the, the usual crime of choosing a subset of the names of the names that should be here. So this is a random subset of the names that should be here, but with some weights corresponding to something. OK, so it's not really. <laughs> Say again? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Bonami? OK. <laughs> Bonami. <laughs> right. So there's some, there's some semi-group noise acting here. I apologize for that. And that's, and that's, the, that's the hyperconductive inequality, which we, which we all know. So, you look at tt at f, at a higher norm p, it's less than f at a smaller norm q, as long as the, the semi-group are for long, long enough, and we know the tight constant for this, so t has to be at least one half log p minus 1 over q minus 1. Okay, so I'm going to go quickly, but please interrupt me if something looks unfamiliar or you want me to go slower. <coughs> so, okay, the, the, the experts in, this, in, in the top, in the next, uh, co Next, next topic I want to comment about briefly, because this is going to be related to what I'm actually going to talk about, is what happens <laughs> if we look at other discrete spaces. So instead of looking at the space 0, 1 to the n with the uniform measure, you can imagine you want to look at some other probability distribution. So for instance, you can look at this space, 0, 1 to the 0, 1 with alpha to the n, which means that alpha is taken with probability 1 in each coordinate independently. You can ask the same question, what can we say <coughs> about hyper, hyperconductivity? Or you can ask about some general product state omega to the n, maybe discrete, maybe not discrete. The question is, again, what can you say about hyperconductivity in this setup? Okay, so again, the semigroup is going to be the same semigroup that we've been talking about before. So again, two interpretations. One interpretation is that if you think about the random walk, the random walk, each coordinate, it keeps the same as probability e to the minus t, and otherwise it picks it according to the stationary distribution on the one-dimensional space that we're looking at. And the functional version is that in one dimension, what we're doing when we act on functions, we take the average with probability 1 minus e to the minus t, and otherwise we take with probability e to the minus t, we take the function itself. OK? So again, this, the, the points I'm putting right now, 
is, since the exports are on the room, I'm not going to, to go into too much detail, but a lot is known. And this is a by, by Krzysztof Oleszkiewicz and, and Pavel Wolf. And uh, there are similar results in, this, in the setup of log Sobolev, uh, log Sobolev inequalities, which we know. And I don't want to go over all of these inequalities, but I'll just, let me just highlight, maybe I should have highlighted in the slides, what are the key, the key what, what is the key points I want you to, to, to look at. So somehow in this hyper, hyper contractive inequality, it looks exactly the same way that we've, we've seen before. So there's a higher norm over here, there's a, there's a lower norm over here. What, what we see is that there's some dependence on the norm, but there's also some dependence on the space. So there's this quantity log of one over alpha, where alpha, in the case of zero one, is the probability of the smallest atom among zero or one, and alpha, in the case of a general discrete probability space, is the probability of the smallest atom in the space. So what does it mean? It means that suppose we all like to apply hypercontractive inequalities, and we are used to doing it in the discrete cube zero one to then with the uniform measure. If we want to apply it in a different product structure, we can do it, but we lose something. What do we lose? What we lose in this scaling, which we talk, we talk talks about the time, what we lose is we, lo we lose a factor, you know, the time has to be bigger by a factor which is log of one over the smallest probability of any atom in the space, right? So, which is something that we, some of us are well aware of, because if you remember, if we looked at examples, say, where the probability measure was, gave one probability one over n, and zero, it gives probability one minus one over n, and we know that, you know, something like KKL doesn't hold in this setup, why doesn't it hold in the setup? It doesn't hold because the hypercontractive inequalities as we know them do not hold. What do we lose? We lose log of one over alpha. When alpha is n, which means that we look a, a, a factor of log n, so it's exactly the log n that we gain we lost, and therefore KKL doesn't tell you anything in this setup where the, the space is very, is very bias, and this is necessary. So these inequalities are, are sharp, and you know, there's nothing you can do about it. These are the type results. Any questions so far? Okay, good. So, now we're going to talk about uh, Borel re Borel's reverse bound. So this is, this is a, a, in a paper of Christa Borel from 82. This notion of reverse hyperconductivity was, was introduced earlier in the Gaussian context in a paper of Borel and, and Svante Janssen also for, that was published in 82. And the setup is the following, the, the statement is the following statement. So again, we are looking at the uniform measure on the discrete cube. Now we, are looking, now we are looking at a positive function, and the inequalities are going to be somewhat reversed. So everything is going to be reversed, and it will only make sense if the functions are positive. So the function here takes positive or no negative value. And the statement is the following. If you look at the Q's norm of t, t of f, it's greater than the P's norm of f, okay? So averaging increases the norm for norm Q that less than norm P, and actually both of the norms are not norms because they don't satisfy the triangle inequality. They're semi-norms because P and Q are both less than one, and they can actually be negative. This is, this is the reverse inequality, and everything about it looks reverse, right? This inequality goes in the other direction. The norms are actually not norms, and you know, everything looks very, very stretched about this inequality. And, and it's, it's, uh, the, this, the Borel paper is a wonderful paper, and in fact, this fact appears in about, the statement and the proof take about 10 lines in the paper. Okay, you know, it, it's mostly about hyperconductivity, and then Christer of Borel observes, he said, well, in fact, you know, if you do the opposite, you know, you see that all the opposites are preserved, and you know, you repeat the same proof, then you have to check the following inequality, and you check it, and it's fine. Okay, so that's everything that is in the paper. It takes a little bit of deciphering to do, but, but Christopher Borel did it very, very nicely in, in the paper, and maybe I'll, I'll comment a little bit how, about how he proved it. Okay, so let me say a little, a little bit more about, about, about the statement. So that's the statement that we're going to talk about. The, f the first question I'm going to ask, for those of you who haven't seen it before, does this statement make any sense? And in order to talk about what sense it makes, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, norms that, or semi-norms for, or, or Oh, this, this norms for p less than one. So the first thing that you have to note is that even without hyperconductivity, if you look at a positive quantity or a positive function, averaging actually increases p's norm for p less than one. Okay, so it, 
indeed, even before any, anything sophisticated, just if you take a Markov operator, you average a non-negative function, the piece norm is going to increase. Similarly, if you look at something, if you want to apply something like cauchy schwarz or Helder inequality, you can do it, but it goes in the opposite direction. So if you look at uh, two norms, P and P prime, that are dual, the sum of the reciprocals is, is one, but the norms are less than one. And in F and G, again, everything has to be positive or non-negative. If F and G are both non-negative functions, then the expected value of F times G, we are used to the fact that it's less or equal than something, but it's going to be greater or equal than something, so it's going to be greater or equal than the P norms of F and the, the conjugate norm of G. So one, of one, of P P uh, one of them is going to be negative. Yeah, but we, we're okay with negative norms. I mean, once you allow yourself the flexibility of the mind to talk about norms less than one, negative norms are not such a big deal. Okay, so it's like, so the norms can be, yes, the norms can be negative too. Okay, and, and, and if you think about these two basic results, which were definitely known to Hardy or probably even before, if you think about these two results, then maybe it's not so surprising that go, things go in the other direction, right? So you expect averaging to increase, but not just in the p norm. Maybe you can even gain more by, by getting something in the, in the smaller norm, in the q norm, that you get in the q norm that, that the average, according to the semi-group of f, is greater than the, the norm or according to the p norm, as long as the, the semi-group aren't for long enough. Okay, so this was just to, to, to ex explain why this inequality might make sense. Okay, so uh, I'm going to explain briefly why is this inequality true. I started at, at 1020, right? Right? Yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to explain briefly why is it true. So I'm going to explain it in a similar way to Borel. I'm going to show you very quickly a short proof and try to convince you that it actually works, but I won't actually go over the proof. And then I'm going to tell you wh what is it good for. So this is all, all uh, very, you know, older news. And then I'm going to talk about what is it true for other spaces. Okay, so here is an, exp you know, usually you do the opposite, right? Usually when you present a part of a paper, the information on your slides is less is less than what's in the paper. What I'm going to do now, I'm actually going to present something that's more in what's Borel's proof of uh, Borel's result, right? So the, <laughs> the reverse result. So it's going in a reverse direction. I'm actually going to expand. I'm going to devote two slides to something that Borel did in like 10 lines, but let me still do that because I think it can be, can be useful. So here is Borel's argument. So Borel says, okay, how do you prove things like that? He said, at the time we reported, he said, we already know that inequalities like this tensorize. And what do we need to tensorize? In, in order to tensorize inequalities like the hyper, in, hyper-contractive inequalities, we, we need Minkowski inequality. And in P less than 1, we have reverse Minkowski. Since the inequality goes in the other direction, since reverse Minkowski was, it's enough to prove it for the case of one dimension. So he says it's in one line. I did it in two. Okay. Then he says, you know, actually you don't have to consider all of the range of the parameters because various arguments about continuity and more important duality it shows you that it's enough to show it for specific v v values of p and q because the other ones are dual of this parameter, so it's enough to show it for parameters p and q as before, but positive, right? The negative ones, even so I said that we are flexible enough to accommodate, actually working with them is a pain. So, you know, duality lets you actually work just with p and q that are strictly positive. And then what's the core of the proof that I'm going to show you in, 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 in the next slide? So the, the core of the proof, we are going to use something that's, uh, you know, not necessarily completely standard in hyperconductivity. We are just talking about positive functions. So up to scaling, we can, we can write our positive functions in the form 1 plus a times x, where a is some number between minus 1, 1. We are, again, we are on the two-point space, right? So every function is a linear function. It's a positive linear function. So up to <coughs> multiplying by a constant, the function that we're looking at is just one parameter. It's 1 plus ax, where a is between minus 1 and 1. Okay, so now all, you know, after applying sort of this general machinery translated to the reverse setup, all we have to do is to prove the, this inequality for this specific functions, for this specific family of functions. Okay, so this is what we need to do. And then you do what you have to do, and, you know, again, I don't think that Borel actually writes these formulas in this paper. I think he only writes this. He says, you have to check this, and this is true. Okay, so this is what he said. But what do you do? What do you do is you say, okay, I'm going to expand the p's norm to the p, and I'm going to, what I should compare it to is the, the norm 
of the Q's norm to the P, but let me first write the Q's norm to the Q. So I write it in the analytical sum that, that I can write it. So this is the P's norm to the P, this is the Q's norm to the Q. And then what I'm interested in actually is the P's norm of this quantity, not the Q's norm, so I have to take the power P over Q. Now P is greater than Q, so I have convexity. So I can just lower bound what I'm after just by the, the, by the first order correction, so I get this expression. Then all I have to do is I have to compare this expression to this expression. And I'm just going to do it term by term, so I have to, comp to show that this expression is always greater or equal to this expression. Then you simplify, and you get that you have to show this inequality. And then, you know, you do the calculus, and you see that this inequality always holds. And this is how you prove the reverse hypercontractive inequality. Very elementary. And it's really, you can give it to first year calculus students, and, you know, you will, you will be able, say again? Of the classical hyperconductive, right? So a proof like that also works for the for the hypercontract. You can also prove the hypercontractive inequality in, in a similar way, and I think actually that's one of the things that Borel talks about in the, about in the same paper. Okay, so you can you know things are reversed, the expansions are different, and so on and so forth. But you can prove the usual hypercontractive inequality in the same. Okay. Good. So yes. How does that compare with the argument in Bonamy's paper, which was ten years earlier? She also proves. Yeah, right, so this is a different inequality. So this is this is different inequality, and you know, as we will see, this this inequality. Okay, so this is related to the sort of the, the general direction which I want to go for in the next ten minutes is is to ask, you know, both the question that Michelle was asking and the question that Ron was asking are the same question. You know, are you doing anything different, or is it actually the same? Right. So that's when I read this paper. That's the question that I was asking. Is it really different than the usual hyperconductivity that we know, or is this reverse really different? So all the arguments I presented so far, and the answer that I, you know, that my answer to Michelle indicates that it's ex in, in fact the same thing. So let's keep different in the sense of what it can be applied to, or different. No, this is di by different. Right. So this is a philosophical so, question. Let's keep it in our head for the next five minutes. I'll give you some applications, and then we'll start answering this question. Okay. So that's that's what I want. It's a good question, but I, that's that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay. So let me let me just give you a, a couple of applications. So this is this is where. I, I, I got to learn about Borel result. So this is a joint work with, again, at least two of the people are in the audience. Uh, so a, a joint paper with Ryan O'Donnell, or the Dreger, Jeff Steiff, and Benny Sudakov, where we use this inequality. And we use it in a setup that I think might be interesting to pe people who are interested in probability in general. So we looked exactly at the setup of points, discrete cube, that are all correlated. So rho is going to be e to the minus t. So the expected value of x, i, y, i is e to the minus t. And for the, the application that we had in mind, we needed statements of the following form. We needed to say that if a and b are two subsets of the discrete cube that are not too small, so let's say each of them is of measure at least epsilon, then the probability that x is in a and y is in b is not too small either. Okay? <coughs> and in fact, what I you can you, do... You, you, all, you rediscovered this... Uh, Right, so among other things, we rediscovered it, even though our proof wasn't, I mean, I think the, the, there was an evolution of the proof which ended by the fact that we realized that Borel proof is the nicest. Okay, but you know, it's like, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, so his proof, we, we realized how, how nice is the proof. You know, we were a little disappointed that it was written in so few lines, right, at, at some point, but you know, it, it, the proof is very nice. Okay, so what do we get in the setup? So we get in the setup that, you know, if you have, if for any two sets that are not too small, the probability that x is in A and y is in B is going to be at least epsilon, well, it's at least the product of the distribution, the probability, this, this is what you would want, epsilon square, but you lose a little bit. What do you lose? You lose a factor of y minus e to the minus t, right? But at least if the sets are, 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 are relatively big and the time t or the correlation rho are, are, are not, the correlation rho is not too close to one, you get that the probability of this intersection events of correlated x and y is, is pretty large. Uh, does and, are there sets A and B which meet this bound? Say again? Are there sets A and B which meet this bound? Yeah, like, yes. So Just essentially this bound is tight for op opposing hummingbirds. Okay, so exponent. Say again? In so the, the exponent. The is not tight. Say again? The constant in the exponent is not tight, right? Uh, I think the const actually, I think the correction is actually of second order, but uh, okay, I don't remember. It's been you know, Dad is younger than me, he remembers better. So it's pretty tight. If you take go to infinity, it's, uh, it's 
Right. So of course, if you get t goes to infinity, you know you expect to, to recover the product, and you can recover the product, but the question here is about the fixity. Right. Very good. OK, and let, let me just mention that the proof of this inequality from this result is, is, is very, very short. You, you take Borel result, you apply reverse Holder inequality. So reverse Holder inequality gives you this inequality. Again, the inner product of G with t, t of f is at least f norm p g norm q. And now it holds for a symmetric condition in p and q. So the condition is t has to be greater than essentially <coughs> minus 1 half log 1 minus q 1 minus p. And the point about this inequality is that if you think Wait, about q and this, p. How, how this, this pro probability x belong to a, y belong to b? How does this depend on t at all? So t, the t depends on t is here. X and y are uh, y t is dependent. T, t. Yeah, x and y are, are, are rho correlated, where rho is e to the minus t. So x is equal to y is probability 1 plus e to the minus t over 2. x i equal to y i. Okay? So when t goes to infinity, x and y are becoming independent, and then you get the trivial bound epsilon square, which is the, co the comment of the low end, that you, know, you get ep epsilon square. And you know, the, cl the closer t is to 0, the, the higher the power of epsilon is. So the more correlated x and y are, the higher the power you get, but still you get some, some result. Okay. So this okay. statement about e to the minus t noisy hypercube expansion, Right, so it's some statement about expansion, and one of the things, uh, of, uh, yeah, it's clear that I'm going to run out of time, but one of the things I want to do, I, I'll, I'll maybe I'll do in a few slides, is I'll talk about comparison of this, of, say, with the expander mixing lemma. Okay, so how does this compare with the expander mixing lemma? So let me get to that. So let me just say the proof of this is pretty, pretty straightforward. The main thing that you have to notice is what the hyperconductivity gives you, it lets you choose both the norm Q and P to be positive. Once the norms are positive, you get the result that lets you actually talk about probabilities of, of the set. If it's negative, you don't, you don't really get it. Okay, let me skip, skip this. The, that was the original application why we cared about this problem in that paper, but let me skip it. And, and again, this is something that I was planning to skip, but you know, one of my favorite area of applications of this result is, is in what's called quantitative social choice. This is an area that was essentially created by Gill. And in most of the results in this area, somehow when you want to prove this strong result without neutrality, you have to use reverse hyperconductivity. And these are the results that are highlighted by red. That's, that's the result you actually need. So that's, that's a very nice uh, area of applications of this result. OK, so let me go back to the philosophical question. This was to convince you that it's useful for something. It's a probabilistic tool that's uh, useful for something. So let me go back to Ron's question and to Michelle's comment, even though Michelle at least knows the answer. Right, so you look at these two inequalities. Sorry again for Bonami for the swap. I should do swap again. So you look at these two inequalities, and you, know, you look at the proofs. And what is the conclusion? The conclusion that I drew for a number of years is that hyperconductivity and reverse hyperconductivity have to be exactly the same thing. You know, the inequalities are, of course, different, but maybe there's some duality, and once you prove one, you prove the other. And, you know, I was just looking for duality proofs. That's just, you know, once you prove hyperconductivity, you get reverse hyperconductivity and vice versa. In particular, one thing that I didn't want to do is I didn't want to recover the result of Pavel and Kshishto for other probability spaces. I said, well, you know, we know the results there. There's going to be some duality. I'm just going to smart and find this duality, and then I'm going to recover all of the results. Okay, so that was my plan for various years. And the surprise, and I think for both of the results of Borel that I'm going to talk about, one of the nice things is that the results are nice, but there's also a surprise. The surprise is that this is false. So it turns out that for reverse hyperconductivity, the inequality actually doesn't depend at all on the underlying space. So you get a uniform reverse hyperconductive inequality, no matter what probability space you're looking at. So here's the result that we got with, uh, with Kshishtof and Arnab. So you look at any, any, any product space omega, omega to the n, any positive function, then you have a reverse hyperconductive inequality of the form that we want with no log 1 over alpha here. There's no dependence on the smallest atom on the space. This just holds completely uniformly. Yeah, so this is an indication, I mean, so it, this was counterintuitive, and the first indication of that was, I think Arnab was doing some simulation. We were trying to actually find the constant, and the constant didn't go to, you know, it didn't have any dependency on alpha, and this was, of course, an indication that we have bugs in the program, and so on, and so on, until, you know, we start, suddenly realized that there's something different going on here. Okay? 
So reverse hyperconductivity is really different than hyperconductivity in the, in the sense that it doesn't depend on all on the underlying space. And let me try to explain. E if f is a constant function, then there is equality, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So for all of this, all of this inequality, whenever you have a const in this case constant positive function, the two sides are just going to be this constant, right? So that's just even this non-norm satisfies this property. Okay, so the result is clear. Okay, so uh, okay, so I already said that. So I, I'll try to tell you a little bit about why is, why this is true, but let me tell you, let me relate it more general to things that that we know. So this doesn't just hold for product spaces; it holds for general uh, Markov semigroups. And and for instance, we know the following two results: whenever you have a log sobel of inequality with constant c. Or a one log Sobolev constant, which is also called modified log Sobolev constant with constant c, then you have reverse, reverse hyperconductivity in the sense that if the time is greater than log 1 minus q over 1 minus p, with this constant over 4, then you have the reverse inequality for every positive function. So this is a diff, this is, okay, this result actually implies the previous result I told you because it turns out that the one log Sobolev inequality or the modified log sobel of inequality holds for every simple probability space, for every simple operator. So this result implies the previous result, but it somehow put, puts it in context and it shows that the reverse hyperconductive inequalities are, 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 are weaker than the standard log sobel of inequalities and they are also weaker than the weaker inequalities that are called modified or one log sobel of inequality. Okay. So that's, that's, that's another part of the picture. And here's, again, the application. So now you have applications like that. Whenever you, you have one log sub-wave or two log sub-wave inequalities, you have exactly the same kind of, of applications that we had before. There's a missing two-factor compared to Borel result, which corresponds to having, having this factor two here that, that we lose. But this now holds for general probability spaces. And just for comparison's sake, <coughs> uh, let's compare it to the, what's called the expander mixing lemma, which is another way of saying that you know, if you have two sets, you know, the probability that x is in A and y is in B is loud. So this is one bound for two sets of size epsilon, you get this bound. And this is another bound, that's the expander mixing lemma. It tells you the probability that x is in A and y is in B is at least the product minus an error term, or it's equal to the, the product up to the error term. What is the error term? The error term is square root of the product of the probabilities of the set times e to the minus t times the spectral quantity. So this is the, what, what you get in the, in the Poincaré inequality. So when you look at these two inequalities, which one is better? Depends. Very good. That's a good answer. I wanted you not to answer at all because it's not clear which but one is. But the mixing lemma applies in much greater generality for graphs and... So right. So what I'm talking about also holds whenever you have... I mean, so, okay. So let's... No. So let's do, let's, do, let's, do, let's do this. Let's compare the setups again. So the setups are completely general. But in one, one case, I'm going to measure things according to the spectral gap. In the other case, I'm going to measure it either according to the log Sobolev constant or according to the modified log Sobolev constant. Right? So we know that these are worse than the spectral gap, but I can do it in any setup that we want. Right? I can talk about a Markov chain, or I can talk about some graphs, I can do it in any setup that I, that I want. And I can compare these two inequalities. This inequality is the, spectra, is the spectral inequality, and this inequality is the inequality that you get from, from this log Sobolev constant. So the difference between them, sometimes this is better, this, the bottom one is better than the top one, and sometimes the top one is better than that, the, the, the lower one. What is the relationship? So essentially what is going on is that if the set A and B are small, where well, small is compared to, to what we, the spectral information that we have on the gap, then this, this error term is going to be much bigger than PA, PB, and we are not going to get anything. However, and then this inequality gives you something that even works if the sets are tiny. If they, even if they're very, very small, you get the, this quantity is positive and you, know, and you get a quantitative bound. However, if the sets are large, in the sense that the square root times the, the, e to the minus t over d is much smaller than the product of the measure of the sets, this typically is going to be a much tighter, tighter result about the probability of x in a and y in b. Okay. And the log sobolev is enough to imply this? Right, so that's one of the things that I quickly said in the previous slide. Log sobolev is enough to, to imply it, but in fact, even a weaker pro property, which is called modified log sobolev, is enough to imply this. So log sobolev is in some sense, in some sense equivalent to hyperconductivity, no? Right, so log sobolev is equivalent to hyperconductivity, but one of the messages of this talk is that Reverse hyperconductivity is implied by something weaker. So it's implied by log Sobolev, it's implied by something weaker that's called mo uh, modified log Sobolev inequality. In particular, again, the example of 
just a space of two points where you have a big measure on one point and a small measure on another point. Here the log Sobolev constant is deteriorating as the space is becoming more and more unbalanced, while the modified log Sobolev or the reverse hyperconductivity remain the same, or you know, there's, there's, there's a uniform lower bound. Okay, so that's exactly, exactly what I'm trying to convey. Good. Other questions? The thing is that in the so in the uh, in expanded mixing level, you usually have an expander and an adjacency matrix, and you are comparing, you are proving a lower bound for this. In the above case, you are actually cha changing the chain, and you are looking at the uh, continuous chain. Right. So, so you need to. If you really right, so I already, the translation is done here. This is the translation of the expander mixing lemma to the continuous time Markov chain. So the comparison is a fair comparison, right? So it's like, I'm, this is the continuous time Markov chain, and, and, and this is the continuous time Markov chain. And the expander mixing lemma doesn't really care if you're in continuous time or in discrete time. The proof is the same proof. The statement is you know, very closely related. So in order to make the comparison, since the stock is in continuous time, I made a comparison in continuous time. But that's a good point, right? So usually when people <laughs> think about the expander mixing lemma, they're used to, you know, you read about it in discrete setup, so, you know, but it's yeah, the I same. I actually didn't read it. I just right, started from the... Right, but it's the same, it's the same in continuous <laughs> setup. That's a, that's a very good comment. Very good. Uh, Elhanan, yes. So a few minutes ago, you were saying that you were hoping at one point Realized that the hyperconductivity and reverse hyperconductivity would turn out to be equivalent. Right. From what you said up to now, is it still feasible that there's an easy way to deduce the reverse from, from the non-reverse? Right. So this is okay. So if I okay. So just so this is what the next you know. The, okay. Maybe I'll, I'll I'll make a vote at some point. You know. So the next slides are supposed to tell you why can you deduce one from the other, right. and what is the relationship between the usual hyperconductive inequality or the usual log suballoc inequality to the inequality that we're talking about right now. Right. So that's what I want to do. Okay. So this slide I'll skip. It talks about situation where you look at Markov chains. This is just for Yuval, global dynamics in high, uh, high temperatures. For other people, you talk about card shuffling. So this inequality holds in this setup, which means, again, if you have one big set, you run into some Markov chain in stationarity, you ask what's the probability that at some time, at, in some big but of measure epsilon set, in some other time, I mean, some other measure epsilon set, you get uniform bounds that just depend on the log sobel of, or the con modified log sobel of constants, right? So this really holds in the more general setup, the, the setup of product chain, right? So these are two examples that are mentioned in our paper. And in fact, Kshishtov also came up with a very beautiful queuing example where well, I'll switch <laughs> Okay, so in fact, the main thing that we're proving, and this, and this, this, is, this, is, uh, this answers to some extent uh, the question that they would ask, is, 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 is asking what is going on here. So, uh, so if you want to, to talk about, to think about it at a high level, one way to think about it at, at a high level is the following way. Uh, we already know, and you know, we had to do a little bit of work because I don't think no, anybody thought about it too seriously in the context of reverse hyperconductivity. But we already know that log sobel inequality and, and, and uh, hypercontractive, or in our case, reverse, reverse hyperconductive inequalities are the same. So this kind of analogy, or, 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 or the fact that you can take, uh, take the uh, derivative of the semigroup and relate it to holds in the gen more general setup that we're talking about. And the main, the main thing that we actually prove in our paper is to prove that these inequalities are monotone. Right? So there's going to be log sobel of inequalities for every norm p. And what we're proving is that this is monotone in the interval between 0 and 2. So if you have log sobel of inequality for p, and you have log sobel of inequality for q, then if p is greater than q, then the p1 implies the q1. So this is one of the reasons why reverse hyperconductivity is easier than hyperconductivity. Could be hyperconductivity. Hyperconductivity is two log sub of inequality, and what we're showing here is that uh, what we, we will show is that, for instance, that log one sub of inequality implies reverse hyperconductivity. So that's the main idea of the proof. So uh, okay, let me. I always like to have a vote in the in the talk. So I have two, uh, I, there are two options. I can tell you a little bit about how we prove this stuff, or I can tell you about plurality is stablest and the standard why. How we prove this stuff? Okay, plurality is stablest and the standard why? Okay, it's about equal, so I can decide, very useful. Okay, so I won't tell you how we prove this stuff. I, I'll, 
I'll just, okay, maybe I'll just make two points. So one point is that you have to come up with the right definition of, of, of P log sub 11 inequality. And there is, the definition is standard in the literature is entropy less than a constant times the Dirichlet form of f to the p minus 1 f. The main, since, yeah, this, there's something really nice if you choose the right normalization. And the right normalization is that you multiply the constants, there's an absolute constant, and then you take some expression that depends on the norm. This expression is p, p squared over 4p minus 1. And only if you take this parameterization, you get this monotonicity that I talked about. Okay, so you have to take the right definition, and in the right definition, the constant in the, 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 the log sub 11 inequality relating the entropy to the Dirichlet form has to be, have to, needs to be some function of the norm P that you're looking maybe, at. So th maybe it's worth saying it's a product of P and the dual of P. Right, so, so, right, so one, of the, one of the things that you'll see here is that this definition is, is you know, one of the reasons you, how you can derive it is you can see that this definition has the property that you satisfy P log sub 11 even only if you satisfy the, the, the dual one, which is also a very aesthetic form and also a reason why it's enough to look at the interval 0 to 2. You don't care about the negatives. The negatives are just the duals of 0 to 1. You don't care about norms greater than 2. They are the duals between 1 and 2. And this shows you that this maybe is the right parameterization. And then, and then you, what you have to prove is you have to prove a statement like that. So this is, this is a statement stronger than what's called the stroke varopoulos estimate. So you have to prove something about the, 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 the Dirichlet energy. But when you look at P and Q now, so you have to prove that if P is greater than Q, then for any number between 0 and 2, you have to prove that this Dirichlet form is less than that Dirichlet form. And this is, of course, not quadratic because there are all these powers, but the Dirichlet forms act in a quadratic way. So this reduces to actually proving a statement about every two numbers A and B. So you have to prove that for every two numbers A and B, you have this beautiful inequality, and then you prove it, and then you get this inequality. And then you plug it into the usual machinery, and the usual machinery will tell you this, 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 this. So uh, this is the two point. This is the two. This is the basic two points in equality that you have to prove. Right. Okay, so this is just an overview of, of, of what's going on in, in the setup. So let me t tell you a little bit about about the other uh, thing that I want to talk about. So this was Borel result. I want to talk about another Borel <coughs> result. All right. So half spaces minimize the Gaussian surface area. Borel theorem says that. If you have two correl row correlated random variables, then if you look at any two functions, f1 and f2, the correlation between f1 on n and f2 of n is less or equal than the correlation between the corresponding half spaces. So these are two functions, f1 and f2. This is two function h1 and h2. The expected value of h, this is a vector, is the, the same as the expected value of f. So f1 is the same expected value of h1. f2 is the same expected value of h2. And that's the Borel result that Ron was mentioning in the previous talk when we talk about two sets. Okay. So that's Borel result. And it implies majority status, which I won't, I won't formulate. Now, for a number of years, I'm obsessed with the following question. What happens if you divide the space into three parts? Okay, so two parts we all understand very well, but what happens if you put, put, uh, partition the space into three parts? And uh, the only result that, that we know, which sort of gave us uh, hope that, that something can be done for three parts, is what's called the double bubble theorem in Gaussian space. So this is from about 10 years ago. There are many authors on the paper. This is why I didn't put it next to the, to, you know, so Corneli, Cohen, Harders, Sassoon, Ksu, Adams. Also, you notice it's not alphabetically. It's clear that something interesting was happening in this paper, and so on and so forth. So all of these people are authors on this paper that show that the double bubble uh, is, is optimal in Gaussian space, except in that case it's called the standard Y. So what is a standard Y? A standard Y is a partition of, of Rn into three parts using three hyperplanes or half, half hyperplanes, all meeting at 120 degrees. Okay, so let me just draw. I should have done it before the talk. So this is the, this is the standard Y, where the center is will determine the measure of the three sets. And what did this guy prove? They address the isoperimetric problem. So you want to find a partition like that which minimizes the surface area. And they said the standard Y minimizes the surface area, well, as long as all of the pieces are essentially of the same measure. So it shouldn't be that the difference between any two <coughs> pieces in measure is more than 0 0.04. But what is this, the question again? What, what is E1, E2, E3? Okay, so this is how I'm, oh, sorry, this is how I define partitions. 
So it's easier to do it in, in vector notation. So I'm going to have three parts of Rn. One of them is going to map to the unit vector A1. One of them is going to be mapped to the unit vector A2. And one of them is going to be mapped to the unit vector A3. What I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the Gaussian surface area, which I'm denoting by gamma plus. So gamma plus, this is the surface area of this partition. And I'm saying that this surface area is bigger than the surface area of the standard y, where y is one of these y's, but this y can be shifted in various ways. And I choose the y that satisfies that the measure of each part is the same as the measure of the corresponding part if in f. The surface area is the area of the boundary? The area of the boundary, yeah, the area of the boundary between the three parts. OK, so in this case, it's just going to be this, this co co one dimension, co-dimension one area, this co-dimension one area, and this co-dimension one area, the sum of these three areas. That's what it's going to be. Okay, so this is related to the resolution of the double bubble theorem, which was a very big, big deal, and in fact they use a lot of the technology that's, be, that's being used there. They couldn't quite prove that the standard y, which in other words you would call a plurality, minimizes the surface area, but it does minimize the surface area if the parts differ by at most 4%. Okay, so that's what they proved. That's all we know. And, of course, you know, given this, there are, there are various natural questions. First of all, just for the Gaussian as a perimetric problem, what, is, what happens if the partition is are not almost balanced? Is the similar statement true for noise stability? And, you know, is what we call plurality stable? Is it true for, for discrete probability spaces? Okay, so these are questions that I'm, ask, I'm asking myself for a lot of time. And in the last two weeks, we realized something. So we realize that the kind of statement that we have in the case of Borel cannot hold, so this, this is again joint, joint discussion with Steven and Joe, we, we realize that this kind of claims that we can make in the, case of, uh, in the case of the theorem of Borel do not hold in the setup that we're talking about now. So now I'm not going to talk about one partition, I'm going to talk about two partitions. So I'm going to consider a pair of partitions. The pair of partitions is going to be given by F1 and F2. And one partition, I want to be a partition to three parts, each of measure one third, one third, one third, one third. And the other partition, I want to be a partition into two parts are going to be of size one half, and one part is going to be of size zero. Okay, so we're trying to do something like Borel result. What did we do in Borel result? We said, okay, I'm going to take two partitions of the space to two parts. In one partition, the measure may be 50-50. In the other partition, maybe the measures are going to be 75% and 25%. What are the best partitions? And Borel said, well, the best partition is to take a hyperplane here and a parallel hyperplane here. One measure is going to be one half of the space. The other measure is going to be three quarters of the space. And this is the optimal partition. Now we're asking a similar question in partitioning in three parts. So if we believe something like Borel result would be true in the y, we'd conjecture that you know, the partition here would be the standard y, the y at the origin of this form. And the other partition would be a y which is partitioning into two, which is just a partition into two half, half spaces. That would be the corresponding result to Borel result in the case of two different partitions. Unfortunately, we can prove that this is not the optimal partition. Isn't it supposed to be like one partition you want the first point of the noisy point? Right, so, th so that's, I mean, there are various versions, but all of the proofs of Borel result that we know also, also hold for two different partitions. And also wait for five more minutes. I'm also going to address this question in another way. But just for now, what all the proofs that we know, we know, we know for two partitions. For two partitions, is actually a very easy proof that this is not the optimal partition. So why is this not the optimal partition? So this is very clear. I mean, this is the, this is the optimal partition. I can just draw what the optimal partition is. So here's the optimal partition. This is going to be the three parts, part one, part two, and part three. Why is this the optimal partition? Well, we can prove it using Borel result. We can prove that this is the optimal partition. But it's also clear. I'm telling you I'm running election between candidates 1, 2, and 3. And at the end of the election, I'm just going to ignore candidate number 3. I'm going to throw them to the garbage. I'm going to say that they were not born in the US. And actually, they cannot be elected. OK, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm asking you, what's the, most, what's the best way to elect the two candidates? So you're going to say, well, I have to assign probability 1 third to each of the candidates. So if there's a g g great majority for one, I'm going to say that one wins. If there's a great majority for two, I'm going to say that two wins. And in the cases that are undetermined, this I'm going to assign to three, because anyway I know that three is not going to win. And this is the most stable partition, and it's more stable than, this, than these two y's. Okay, so you can prove it, and you know, the proof shows that this is, you know, whatever the extension of Borel result would be to two parts, doesn't hold for three parts in the setup. 
But in India, as a professional complaint, he said, oh, but usually when we talk about you know, stateless, we want the same partition twice, right? And in many hardness of approximation sets up, that's, that's sometimes what you want, not always what you want. So this is also not true, if, but we only know it if the partitions are almost balanced and always go to zero, okay? So now I'm going to partition the space once, and I'm going to take two correlated Gaussians, and I'm going to ask the two correlated Gaussians to land in the same part of the space. And the claim is that among all partitions of R into three parts, such that the first part has a measure one third plus two eta, the second measure is the second and the third part have measure one third minus eta, one third minus eta, the partition maximizing the probability that you fall in the two parts is not given by a standard y, assuming that the correlation law is sufficiently small. Okay? Unfortunately, some some smart and not so smart people conjectured that plurality is stateless. So I'm, you know, I'm involved in this group, so you can guess who are the smart and not smart. This still doesn't, this still doesn't contradict the conjecture that plurality is stateless, because the smart people in the plurality is stateless group made sure that we only talk about balanced partition, where all the measures are exactly one third, one third, one third. So this doesn't contradict the plurality is stateless conjecture, but it contradicts something very, very close to that. What does it mean in election terms? In election terms, it means, for instance, suppose you're running an election, and you know the bias between the two candidates, one of them has a little bit more chance than winning the, the two others, and you're asking what's the best way of electing among the three candidates, it's not going to be a plurality election, it's going to be something else. And in the binary case, uh, majority is... Majority is always. If the biases are moved, in which direction majority is always disturbed, here something much more, much more delicate is going on. So let me tell you why this is true, and then, then I think I'll run out of time and I'll finish the talk. So again, this is true, this is true only when the, the quantity rho is sufficiently small, and the correlation is sufficiently small, and basically what you do is you do an expansion when rho goes to zero. So when you do the expansion of when rho goes to zero, as many of you know, the, the, the correlation between the f of x and f of y, well, the first time is just coming from the, the zero zero level Fourier coefficient, which, you know, I'm writing it this way, this is vector notation, right? So this is really the zero le level Fourier coefficient. And then there are going to be the first order of Fourier coefficient. What are the first order of Fourier coefficient? Well, the first order of Fourier coefficients are just the center, the distance of the center of masses of these partitions from the origin squared. Okay? So this is the standard y, and it turned out that if you shift the standard y a little bit, then the, the, the center of mass is shifting in a way that doesn't satisfy the property. So for the standard y, you have the property that all of these angles are 90 degrees. I don't know if I succeeded. So this is 90 degrees, this is 90 degrees, and this is 90 degrees. And this is, what, yeah. this is 90 degrees. So all of these are 90 degrees. And it turns out that if you shift the standard y a little bit, and you look at the center of masses, it's not 19 degrees and a little more. And if it's not 19 degrees, it's, it, it turns out that you can make a, lit, a little bit of modification of the sets that will increase this quadratic quantity while preserving the measure of the set, so it's not optimal. Okay? So the, what is the conclusion from that? The conclusion of that is that if plurality is stateless, it's true. It's true in very, very special cases. And all the proofs that we are used to think about proving inequalities like that do not we, you know, really, we don't know a proof that is so specialized. Probably if it's true, there are some very interesting phase transitions that relates to rho, and you know, you know, there's some of the various parameters come into interplay in a much more interesting way. And this project looks even more ambitious than it looked 10 years ago or five years ago when I started thinking about it. Okay, so I stop here, thank you. No, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know any argument. I think, you know, maybe we re that's the way to start thinking about it, right? More really in a more basic form, you know, about what can you characterize, right? And, and one of the things that one can try to do is to follow the literature of the double bubble <coughs> theorem proof, which is, a, you know, 10 or 15 <coughs> papers, and to try to see claim by claim which claim you can prove, right? Because this is how they start. You know, a lot of the work is just proof connectedness, and proving that the faces are, you know, faces are nice and so on and so forth. But you know, it's it's something that one can try to do. But I don't know any of the statements uh, currently. So, so the 
classical hyperconductivity hyper gives you uh, ex various tail estimates on, on chaos, do you, does, do your, if you reverse the hyperconductivity, do you get some information about tail estimates? Right, so, so it's something I thought about and I, 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 don't, I, don't know any, I don't know any application. All applications that you should, right, so one thing, it's, it's related to maybe some question that was asked after Hamid talked. One thing that you have to take into account is that in many of these tail estimates on chaos, we know that they become worse and worse depending on the space that you're looking at. Right? If from Gaussian you move to some other space. Let's look at the Rodemacher chaos. Right, no, but what I'm saying is that whatever you do with reverse hyperconductivity, the result will not depend on the space if you just use reverse hyperconductivity on its own. Right, so the kind of estimates that you're looking for are different than the usual estimates that we know that, that do depend on the space. And one candidate I was actually looking after the talk was this Bourguin statement about comparing the Q-norm of this. I mean, so this is a kind of statement that doesn't depend on the space. So statements like that, which we are usually not... not Bourguin, sorry, Bourguin, Bourguin's estimate. So, so this, this, this estimate, this kind of estimate, we may, may try to prove this way, but I don't know any, any proof that actually goes along this line. It's a very natural question. And India? Yeah, sorry. Uh, maybe there should be application of the reverse uh, HP compare to, uh, to hippo ellipticity, because it seems it gives you that you have something like a density that you have uh, amelioration. So, uh, you it's would pass, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Go to PD. I, I was wondering if you move, you have your definition of the boundary, Here. which is a total, but remember that in the top you mean uh, higher uh, giga inequality, yeah, yeah. which you related. It's not measured like that, it's more a max of the mean. Right. So maybe there is something going to see. If you change the definition, not taking the sum, as you... You mean here, for this yes, problem. Yes. Right, but for, for this problem, I mean, the question about the stability is actually coming... I mean, the application is very, you know, the reason that people conjecture that plurality is stableless is that it's, it's a very natural extension of the fact that majority is stable. Right? If you think about voting, majority is the best, you know, so you think what is the extension of majority to other voting setup? It's plurality, right? So, I mean, this, this I mean, it's, it's, it's true that one can think of alternative question, but, you know, there was a reason for the question being asked the way it was asked, right? So, but it's, it's, you know, still one can explore other directions, but that was the reason the question was asked this way. Okay, uh, thank you.